All right, guys, welcome back. We get another pivotal interview slash discussion. And throughout all of these that I've done, I think I've done about two dozen at this point, um, I have tried to hit every conceivable angle or at least the most important ones and bring on thought leaders and people that are much more advanced in these areas than I am because you guys get to hear me talk all the time about certain things. But this is a topic that I know I cover a lot on my channel in some semblance, but never in the deepness that it needs to. And that's something that probably is my fault that I've overlooked because if you think about consumer packaged goods, the word packaged and just design, creative and all that around that is obviously a part of the name of the category and it's super important. So I actually have a good friend of mine, somebody that I have worked with before and worked with his agency before with clients. And this is Jared Strain and he is the co-founder and partner of Super Top Secrets. And I think at this point, Jared, I think you've been doing this for like more than 10 years, correct? Uh, we just hit 11 years in October, yeah. Congrats, that's a... Uh, yep. I think any business, you know, I think the life cycle is much shorter than that. And, and um, you guys have been able to push through and, and had a lot of like impressive clients across like a ton of different verticals. And I wanted to kind of talk about like maybe just like how you got started into design, like on a very basic level, because I think that it's, it's interesting. And then like, how does that, you know, kind of move into owning, you, you know, your own creative shop? Like, Where's that move? Because for me, I, you know, I'm on the client service side, but I've never really wanted to move into like an actual agency part. I just like kind of working for myself. And I know that you've probably had in your back of your mind, like, you know, when am I going to make that jump? Because I think you started out as a designer before you owned an agency, correct? Yeah. So I guess like the, the long story short would be is uh, everything started for me with skateboarding. And I've kind of, I've gone on a diatribe a time or two and there's probably a few articles out there in the world that kind of tell that story but early on having grown up skating punk rock metal uh, it just kind of pushed me into this like subculture that was like really visual and so like that in and of itself has a very definitive way that you communicate and so when it gets into speaking to subcultures like i always kind of use skateboarding as a reference because without that like trends kind of come out of those places, um, and we pay attention to those still um, a lot to this day. But I started out skateboarding um, and doing graphics on like for the wheels and the, the base art, as well as like simple websites. And it just kind of pushed me um, unknowingly into this world where we got really good at communicating to like, like very niche markets. Um, and that was kind of the genesis of it all. And from there, into school, my first uh, first part of my career was up in the Northwest in Seattle, and up in like, geez, I came out of school 2002, 2003, right there where the bubble was about to burst, and so I floated my book up and down the West Coast, the East Coast, and I had a lot of interviews. But because my roots and like my visual style kind of uh, lent itself to this place that a lot of people didn't understand. Um, it was always like, hey, you know, this looks good and all, but can you do this or can you do that? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. It's just we, we just communicate as human beings and it's just how that presents itself. Um, and a lot of people just couldn't understand that. But luckily, my, my boss and my mentor in Seattle, he fully understood kind of where I was coming from. And that trickled right into working immediately into um, like action sports, snowboarding primarily, like Ride K2. Roxy, um, Atomic, um, you name it, we, we, we worked on it. And in turn kind of trickled into youth-centric products, toy packaging, toy structures, um, toy identities. And that's kind of where it all started. Um, the shop itself was kind of an accident. I mean, if you're talking about really taking the leap, I, I never wanted to be a business owner. I, I enjoyed having like people around me and like, you know, like, unlike you, where you kind of like being by yourself, I need stimuli and loud music and influence. And um, it kind of spun out of control from there. Like I had a handful of clients that wanted work done. They wanted new services. And so I had to keep cobbling on like strategy and digital in, in addition to like my, my art background. So 
Um, very accidental, very happy it kind of turned out that way, but geez, thinking back 11 years later, it was a complete accident. As you guys have, have evolved and you, you as a de designer has evolved, like, do you find yourself still trying or, or making sure that you're kind of paying attention to like the bleeding edge or like some of those subcultures or just my own like stuff that I do with strategy? I'm always looking out in different sectors or industries and not necessarily at you know the biggest baddest companies but like mm -hmm. who's those bleeding edge upstart like really creative companies that are just doing things totally different and then i try to like mash that into what i'm doing and, and hopefully it can you know draw some inspiration or, or sometimes even just get somebody to flip their thought pattern around and go oh i've never looked at this in in this way but i found that the the more that i've progressed the harder it is to kind of do that on a on a day to day basis mm -hmm. because you are so kind of like caught up in I guess just life. I for me I think it comes down to still being a part of that community. Like I still I still skate religiously. I have two young boys that have kind of like picked up that as well. And so I think just in part being a part of that community, like it, it transcends skateboarding. I, I mean, like I said, I kind of use that as like the example throughout kind of what I do, but. For me, like being a part of that subculture gets into music and hip hop, you know, like hip hop, punk rock, fashion. Um, and you see it's very cyclical. Like right now, the 90s is having a very mm -hmm. resurgence. And that in turn kind of dictates like design trends, color. Um, and even with a lot of the work that we do with Rosignol Snowboards, who we've worked with for 14 years, even prior to, to Super Top Secret, um, because we are essentially working two years ahead of, of, of market, like we're having to pay attention to like color, color trends and really kind of a lot of that bleeding edge of, you know, what's going to be the next hot thing? Where, where is this world going that we can leverage um, visual communication? And so, yeah, I think it's imperative to have those type of people around you, people that are not necessarily in the same community, like skate community that I would be, but, you know, that have that passion for music. And like I said, like hip hop or something that just kind of is a subculture of sort. And so you get a real sense of how those people talk and what stimulates them and where they're found online. And you're looking at, um, communication trends. I mean, like, who, who would have known we're sitting here in 2020 and the world is kind of going nuts with memes. But now you're seeing, like, legit marketing and advertising happening in those circles with sponsored ads. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because we saw that coming ages ago, but I didn't think it would have been on this scale. And maybe it's just the pandemic that kind of tipped a lot of hands. But there's trends and there's things and there's moments in time that you kind of like need to pay attention to and, and leverage um, in both strategy and in visual. Yeah, I know this year has been, I think, just interesting overall in terms of creative because it seems like it brought everything to ultimately like where it was going to go anyways. I, I don't necessarily think, you know, we could say COVID-19 effect like was a starter. I think it was really like an accelerant in a lot yeah. of cases. And you know, you saw a lot of at least like creative being like stripped away a little bit in the sense of like being more, I think, um, transparent or more like um, in the moment, um, you know, shot first person, maybe on a phone or, or things like that in, in, in kind of the native way that people are consuming their communication or, or just marketing messages now. And, and you saw those things being translated into like the biggest stages where you had these brands that were spending a ton of money on TV ads, but they were being produced in a way that was, you would think would be on TikTok or on Instagram yeah. or on you know Facebook. And I think everything was gonna move in that direction over time, but it was interesting that this year, it was a big thing that I noticed, especially during like the the heart of the, the pandemic when we were all kind of just like stuck at home, like you started to see a lot of these um, different advertisements or, or marketing that was put in, in the biggest mediums out there that were, you know, the most basic production. Um, yeah. And, and I found it interesting because it was like getting down to just the, 
the message or, or just how people are used to consuming stuff all day. And it was like, why should we not look at this as, as a possibility and be flexible and be nimble? Because it seemed like this year gave people a chance or at least the the okay to, to make uh, something different, to try some new things. And, and you know, people aren't going to, you know, shoot you for doing something risky this year, I think, because everybody was trying to do something a little bit different. Yeah. And I think, it, I mean, I think a little bit of that is in part due to just the, the uncertainty, you know, like you had budgets that were, they were getting stripped away. So they're like, okay, we're going from big high production value, like, TV commercials and broadcasts that have a lot of gloss and glitter to, oh, geez, we don't know if we're going to be in business next month. How can we kind of strip away 90% of what it was going to cost and do it in real time, do it quicker to generate revenue, you know? And so I think you're right. Like it's more of an accelerant. And I think that in turn has forced everybody um, online. Like every, I mean, everything's digital. I mean, I think that kind of goes without saying, but like you're now getting just, messages served up in so many different places that that there's probably going to be a backlash at some point but who knows like it's kind of where the world's at right now and like transparency is one thing you're seeing those posts that have to be kind of dictated as as marketing and you can sniff that out pretty pretty quickly i want to kind of drill down a little bit more towards like the consumer packaged goods brands that you work with or just talk specifically around that category because I know a lot of my community is really focused on there. And I want to talk since we're, we're mentioning around just some of the trends, but I will kind of mention around like some bootstrapping best practices or um, what, you know, upstart brands, emerging brands, like what would you say like to focus the most of their attention on? Because obviously if they have, you know, venture funding and they have all this money and they can go out and spend, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on creating this beautiful brand and, and every element of it is great. That's one thing. But I'd imagine that there's very few and far between those. And there's a lot more of the I have a really great product, a really great idea. I have this thing that I want to put out in the world. Where do I put my most attention to actually get some traction? That's a great question. And it's one that kind of gets thrown at us all the time. I mean, like people want to save money. I think it goes without saying. Yeah. Um, I can't believe that I, that I'm about to say this because like I'm a traditional designer. Um, but it, had you told me 20, 25 years ago that I would be sitting here and telling you that I think getting your voice and your tone and your message completely baked and dialed um, to like come out to the world with, I, I I firmly believe that that's imperative. Um, I think you need to be authentic at every turn and art and visuals is kind of subjective and you can kind of break that apart. But when it comes to like how you speak, how you communicate with your consumers, um, understanding how they communicate amongst themselves. And that kind of goes back to this whole like tribal mentality of you need to understand that. So when we get into brand building, it, I'm like, yeah, I mean, that needs to kind of be solidified. You need to understand like who you are as a brand, as a brand to your prospective consumers. Um, and so that I think that's a pretty heavy, heavy lift in terms of defining that, understanding how that comes to light, um, whether that voice is going to be controlled from the person that creates it, i.e. like, you know, the 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 entrepreneur, or if it's going to be like a brand manager or a social community manager, they need to understand how to speak appropriately, authentically. And that's where I would start. Um, and like I said, it's a little weird for me because like I love beautiful, big, beautiful, audacious um, 360 type experiences, but they're all for naught if you can't communicate and understand like who you are to the world and, and how you say that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, agree with you in terms of that being extremely important and also around so many products so many substitutes in every category and there's a lot of like really great legacy brands that have fit into this mold with consumers for the longest time and they have this nostalgia and they have this you know kind of part of the heart is is with them or they're you know they have they live somewhere inside of this person so when you are launching something that is attacking or, or just trying to you know, gain some market share in these these places. You have to be 
different and it has to go past i think the surface level of you know a, be a beautiful design though i think that is the the thing that catches people on shelf and that's sometimes what ultimately picks that product up and maybe that is what gets you to buy it at a grocery store or whatever but for that brand to sustain and stay alive they have to probably have something much beyond that they have to have some emo emotional connection with these consumers that are past just this great product and a lot of these very large legacy brands have not done a good job at like defining that part you know they've they've stayed true to what their heritage is and they and they their product forward or just nostalgic forward but they they haven't had to, I guess, until recently, had to have that voice and tone and everything that is resounding with the consumer that, you know, Gen Z or millennials are really looking at and saying, does this match up with me? Do I feel like this brand personifies me? Do I know what they're about? Do I know, you know what ultimately this money is going to? You know, there's those questions that constantly come up now as a consumer when you are trying to spend your money in certain categories, certain ways. Obviously, there's categories that people maybe don't care about. Maybe you just pick up toothpaste and you're like, does it clean my teeth and does it taste uh, good in my mouth? That's yeah. fine for me. And then there's a lot of categories though that you do drill down a little bit deeper and you want to know about the entrepreneur. You want to know about what, you know, how they're talking and how they're supporting the community. Um, I think this year has been a big example of that where a lot of brands have had to, to ask themselves those questions like where do I where am I at on this discussion and and do I feel confident enough to actually get out there and, and talk about it? Absolutely. We had a client legacy uh, ski resort up in Idaho, Sun Valley, that just kind of rested on their laurels for what seems like an entire generation. Like our our parents, like I say, are like I'm probably ten years your elder, but like. Our parents, they had this legacy of Hollywood and this kind of glitz, and it was kind of a destination. Well, they didn't market for an entire generation. So, like, there's, there was a category of consideration there where people just weren't coming, and they were kind of dying on the vine. And so when you speak about this, it's like, yeah, it, it's not just for startups. It's for those legacy brands that need to continually understand, like, what that means to the next generation and, and how you continue to, like, drill down into like that message and like that essence of what's so special about them as a brand and you need to reinvent how you like reintroduce yourself to like those people like keeping a lot of things intact and so it is i don't think it's completely immune to consumer products um i've seen it in tech um like ski and lead like destination recreation it kind of transcends if you're a brand, um, what does that mean to the person that is considering handing you a dollar bill versus the other person? Talking about packaging a little bit more with um, CPG, and, and this could be brought in past CPG, but as every category has moved more and more online, we shop for things through e-commerce, especially this year, we've seen kind of three or four years ahead in the future. Have you seen an evolution in terms of like, client asks in terms of like packaging, like, you know, putting more emphasis in certain areas, maybe putting less emphasis in some other areas, just because they know less product is going to be sitting on shelf over or sitting, you know, on a white background on an Amazon website or on a Shopify website. Has you, have you seen any of that? Or has there been like things in your mind that you've said like, okay, this is, um, this has been a change. I've certainly seen a change, and I'm trying to figure out a way to really quantify that question. Um, like, everybody wants to have the most impact in their space, whether it's on shelf or um, online, you know, and depending on like where they're actually found online. Like, I think there's more emphasis if you're inside of like a platform like Amazon to make sure that it's like crystal clear what this product is, because, you know, you have one shot at capturing that consumer and understanding, helping them understand like what the product is versus the experience that you'd have walking into a store and picking something up and having something like really beautiful and tactile and having, having it stand out against the crowd in that space. Um, so yeah, I've seen, I've seen with the focus of products going direct to consumer or on Amazon, it, it absolutely is kind of one of those 
those instances where you need to really either like understand who you are as a brand and present that like really well, you know, and I think like you and I and a common friend with, with ghost, like they do that really well. It's brand. Like you see that first and foremost, but it also just kind of jumps out of you. Um, in, in another space, depending on if that hierarchy gets flipped, if it goes from product benefits to brand, you're kind of losing out on that opportunity to tell a story and really kind of find a, a brand advocate. So you're kind of, you're, you're trading like money for like loyalty at that point on some level. Um, and I've kind of seen that shift a little bit. Some people that are really, that really get good brand and storytelling and understand that like consumers buy stories and not products get that. But, you know, like you said, everything's been so sensationalized now with, with the pandemic and everything kind of going into this digital, being forced into this digital space that you're seeing some of those hierarchies kind of flip and those considerations kind of fall to the wayside, which is kind of sad, but you understand, like we do understand like why that kind of has to happen in some instances. Yeah, you made a point around just kind of with packaging, not necessarily picking it up and that being kind of that differentiation point for you know, purchase. Um, but in, in the same sense, like if you were to kind of like, I don't want to say dumb it down, but like the packaging gets so penny pinched to the point where it's um, just so basic. When somebody does order that from your website, they get it, they still are going to touch that at that mm -hmm. point. And then they have already bought it. They're obviously not going to, I mean, I don't think very often probably ever send it back saying like, oh, the, you know, the, the label didn't have some layers or textures to it or, or you know, those types of things. But that might be the difference between somebody deciding to buy it again. So it moves like a little bit from the, you know, into like the, the, the retention, I guess, phase mm -hmm. where like, you know, if brands are looking at this and saying, I want to pull back all costs possible. Um, there needs to be, I think, a reason why you would do that. Like if there's the reason is I want to make sure I can cut down on maybe the uh, packaging, single use packaging or something like that or sustainability so that I want to I want to cut some of that stuff away or maybe I want to um, make sure that the package is optimized for e-commerce shipping. So it needs to be in a certain shape or it needs to be, you know, whatever. I think that's a story in itself that somebody could say, why am I doing this? And why does it not look as beautiful as maybe some other brands do? Because I'm focusing more attention on maybe sustainability or maybe, you know, the, um, just what we're dealing with right now, with just so many of the, um, shipping, um, things getting really like clogged up right now and, and there's backed up and, you know, you're trying to create efficiencies and help things out. I think if you have a reason why you're doing those things, it makes sense. But I think for people, a lot of times they're defaulting to, well, just don't care anymore. And I don't think that's the case. They do care. They just, mm -hmm. so different than them picking it up at the store and saying, Absolutely. oh yeah, I think it moves a little bit further towards like the retention piece. And that might be the difference between you having a reorder or you not having a reorder. You know, that's a, that's a really good insight because um, it just dawned on me that like, yeah, that has kind of been, become a real emphasis with a few of our clients, like what, what that experience is on their doorstep, like how do you, what does the unboxing look like? And so there has been like more attention put into communicating with them, maybe less so on the actual packaging, but what that experience is when they unbox it. Is there a nice, like for, instance, for example, um, is there a nice handwritten card from from the the entrepreneur or whomever just saying hey thanks for your purchase you know like we really appreciate it, especially in in this time of um time of year time of day whatever you will have you and using that as a vessel for communicating you know in the shipper box we've had we've done geez five or six different shipper boxes just in the interest of like kind of conveying brand and using that as like a moment to capture attention you know, albeit if it really has that experience with the tactileness or whatever, when they actually put it in their hand. But you know, like from the doorstep, from you know, from the shopping cart to the doorstep, there, it needs to be thought out and understand that it's it's an opportunity. Every time somebody engages with you as a brand, what does that look like? How do you show up? What do you say? Um, say thank you. Like just general considerations um, in very uncertain times.
Yeah, if you roll that into, I guess, thinking about how many times do you see somebody doing an unboxing for, say, like, um, you know, whatever, Colgate toothpaste, and then how many unboxing videos do you see on YouTube for, like, Apple products or something like that? Like, people take it to that level because the packaging is so beautiful and it's just like that unboxing experience and you want to share it with the world because you're so excited over just here's this thing and I'm going to use it and I'm going to buy another one and I'm going to buy another one. And not to say that Colgate could have that impression because of the way that that product is consumed, but I think there's probably a lot of things they could do to, to up their game in that area, especially as more people will purchase these items um, through e-commerce. I wanted to transition into like some trends and, and things that you're seeing because you have to lean forward a lot with some of the clients that you're working with. I mentioned it earlier in the video. So I want to get a little sense of maybe where you're feeling like um, some trends are happening in 2021 or even beyond that point. Because in CPG, I think there's been this time, there's this like this direct to consumer CPG phase we're in right now where it's like very, minimalist, very muted colors, very, um, you know, like classic, uh, like fonts. And there's like, that seems to be like put through the washing machine over and over and over and over again in every category. And I'm a little over it at this point. Like I'd like to see what the next thing is because I feel like I keep seeing copycats of every single product in so many different ways from these new entrepreneurs that are launching these subscription models or, or things like that. Yeah, it's it's funny because typically by the time, well, because we, we pay attention, you and I, to this space like so heavily, we, we see the trends, we're ahead of them, and by the time they actually hit consumer shelves, we're, we're yeah, completely, we're done with it, we're over it, it's already passe, right? And so it's it's trying to stay ahead of that curve and really, um, helping like your client understand, well, just helping your client trust that that you're making the right decision, and that comes in form of just that connection you have with them. And so, geez, trends like I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big believer in authenticity. I mean, um, for example, and this isn't a client, this isn't anything other than just like something that I'm passionate about. But I love what Liquid Death has done in that space. It's water. It speaks to me like as a consumer because it kind of pulls me back into like those that that metal arena and everything that they do on the marketing side. I probably get like two or three emails from them a day and it's just like new swag, new t-shirt graphics, new limited run koozies, and we just we buy all that shit up. But that to me is a very authentic spin on what they've done with just canned water. And so I think as far as like a trend goes, um, I'm seeking out and I'm paying attention to those brands that have like a deliberate point of view. And you get that from, from Liquid Death, absolutely. You're right, it's, either, it's love, hate. You either you get it or you just absolutely hate it and they lean into that. And I love brands that do that. Like whatever that space is, um, women's skincare, sports nutrition, uh, recreation, like, you, it, it goes back to like that voice and that tone and understanding like who you are and who your tribe and your people are and how you speak to them. And so I, I hope that that, that trend kind of continues. I've seen a lot of people taking like similar positions in just the way that they, that they market to like their consumers. If you're getting into like color trends and those kind of things, I think those kind of go so quickly that it's hard to really kind of pinpoint like if there is kind of an emerging trend that we're going to see here in the space soon. But I think a lot of people having been forced into digital spaces and having to reinvent what their story is, you're going to see more and more of those kind of isolated instances where they're just like really true to who they are at, at their core and how they show up and how they speak. And I think those are the ones that are going to really rise to the top and really make some noise. I love that point because I think there's going to be a lot less billion dollar CPG brands. And that's not to say that there's not a lot of great entrepreneurs, not a lot of great brands, but I think the brands that are going to win, like you were saying about the um, 
taking those like, I don't call them hard lines, but like really finding this authentic voice and going after this niche of people, those are going to be successful, but they're going to be the you know, $200 million, $300 million, $500 million. There's going to be a cap, but they're going to be okay with that cap because they're going to want to focus on the exact person that they're speaking to. They're going to build that tribe, that community, and really focus as deep and as strong as possible in that area because they know that's the only way to build these high-flying, sustainable businesses over time because there are a lot of really great already like commodity brands and, you know, the, there's always another low cost option. There's all these types of things, but for them to stand out and, and build these kind of really cool hip brands, it, it has to go way past this kind of vibe that they're putting on now. And what I mentioned before was like very like just muted, you know, very minimalistic and all. Like I get it. I I mean, I like it in the sense of that I'm just a pretty boring dude in terms of like like my, the way that I dress, the way that or whatever, like that's not how I define a lot of things. So as I consume products, I like things to be pretty simple because my mind's so chaotic all the time that it helps me. But I don't think that that's the necessarily the case for a lot of people. I think that they are looking for that thing that like is an extension of them. I mentioned uh, to somebody recently that like people aren't necessarily buying brands anymore because they are brands and they're adding accessories. Mm -hmm. They're looking for accessories to their own brand today. That's and I think that yeah. as like, yeah, as consumers, like especially the younger ones, you know, your, your kids, as they start to age up into like, you know, having their own spending habits and just generation Z, like some of the things that they've been showing right now, they're thinking of themselves as a business because I think of the influencer mentality and like, Hey, we can make money at our So, so, they're not necessarily looking for other brands to speak for them. They're looking for the extensions of who they are as a brand themselves. And they become like these accessories that they're adding into their own personal brand. So I think that a lot of brands today are going to have to wrap their heads around that and realize like, how do I fit into these communities, these tribes? How do I actually you know, get into that area? And they have to go as deep as possible. And that might not mean that you're going to be this humongous brand, but like, I think, setting that stage and saying, oh, 50 million is okay, 100 million is like, whatever that is, you know, I mean, I think those are really big, huge businesses already, but like not going out and saying, I'm going to build the next billion dollar brand because there might not be too many of those anymore. Yeah, I, I think it used to, it used to feel that, that marketers felt that consumers were like fairly dumb, you know, and um, having a young, young family I've paid attention and I've seen like how my kids recognize brands and what they kind of grab onto. And so it, they're fully indoctrinated. I mean, like kids are being handed tablets and phones and paying attention to Instagram and TikTok. And they're, they sniff that, they sniff it out really fast. They understand like what resonates with them, like as a person, as a, just like a small person, not really a defined person. And so I think that, that it is like you said it's imperative to really define that and figure out who you are um and it doesn't have like muted color palettes and like those kind of beautiful things are like very appropriate for um for certain people and certain brands and so like i love them as well like i i purchase them but the analogy of being an accessory like yeah people that's who they are and that's how they buy products nowadays it's just like they're extensions of oneself here and there and they'll put it on the back of their car. I've seen some ridiculous stickers on ridiculous faces. <laughs> I'm like, really? Like that? I'm like, all right, if that's who you are as a person, like I can, I can respect that, but it is, it's very much gone beyond just a package good to an extension of your own identity. Well, I appreciate the conversation, Jared. I mean, it was great. A lot of insights, I think, that was shared. I want to make sure that if people are interested in maybe following you or, or following the agency, um, you give a plug so somebody could do that. Sure, absolutely. Um, agency, you can find us on all your social channels, um, Super Top Secret. Um, me, personally, I am on all those as well. Jared Strain, um, Juan underscore Barbados on Instagram. But uh, find the agency, www.wearetopsecret.com, and reach out. Like, I love just speaking, just hearing from people, regardless if there's any kind of involvement or uh, any movement beyond there. I appreciate the time, Jared. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you wanna help support me, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up button on this video. If this is 
the first time you've been introduced to my videos. Would love for you guys to be a part of my community by subscribing to my channel. I upload several videos just like this weekly. And if you guys wanna connect further outside of this platform, I do include all of my social media links down below. I just wanna thank you guys again for your time. Hopefully I gave you some value in return and we'll see you guys on the next video.